Good evening, everybody. It is now 447, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this workshop is called Made in the USA, Origins and Consequences of the So-Called Color Revolutions. It is sponsored by UNAX Odessa Solidarity Campaign. Uh, I am a staff member on that campaign. My name is Kat McNeil. I'm a member of the Richmond-based Defenders for Freedom, Justice, and Equality. Uh, and I will be guiding us through it today. So we have seven speakers. Um, as was the case at our last uh, plenary, each speaker will have eight minutes. Um, speakers, as you can see, Terry's got our signs. Uh, she's going to signal to you when you have one minute remaining and when your time is up. Uh, and because, as we all know, these things tend to go long because we all have um, impactful and important things to say, it is important that we stick to the time limit. And guys, we're going to try to get you out of here on time. Uh, so that is about the end of the housekeeping. Um, so I guess without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mr. Chris Gilbert of Venezuela. He's going to speak on uh, Venezuela versus imperialism, how the popular movement has resisted the counter-revolution. Um, Mr. Gilbert is a professor, or Professor Gilbert is a professor of political science um, in Venezuela and a co-founder of Escuela de Corados, a Marxist educational program um, on Viva Televisión. So uh, without further ado, here is Chris Gilbert. Uh, thanks very much. I, I want to say it's great to be in a space like this where, and there are not many spaces like it where you come and people are already anti-imperialist. So, Also, uh, as a basis of things, so one of the things I want to say is being anti-imperialist is really not enough. It's kind of people, the, the left often thinks about a minimum and a maximum program. And actually those should be kind of a more synthetic relation between those two things. So if you say the minimum program is anti-imperialism, I think we should put some of the maximum program in there too, and the, and the historical moment calls for that. But I'll say something more about that at the end. Um, it, the, I, I'm also not used to talking in this kind of space, too, because I, I don't really devote myself to studying the details of U.S., the study, studying the details of the taxes of U.S. imperialism. My real interest is how to defeat it through unity of the masses, through developing a socialist program and things like that. Of course, the first thing is important, especially important in this kind of context, where people are living inside the belly of the monster, as you people say, a phrase that interestingly comes from Jose Marti, the great Cuban uh, Prosser, we say. Um, but I, I think it's important to lay out some of the, important, some of the steps of U.S. imperialism and its, and its hairy hand in the Venezuelan context. So to say something interesting, to start with an interesting tidbit, I actually believe that U.S. started to intervene against Chavez before Chavez was president. There was actually an attempt to do a preemptive coup d'etat, which fortunately failed, uh, bef before Chavez became president in 1998. And then immediately the heat started to go on. Everyone knows there was a US-sponsored coup d'etat in 2002. Following that was something that was perhaps even more dangerous, which was the, the work, the uh, kind of the owner's shutout of the, of the petroleum company, the PDVSA, which lasted and brought a lot of people into a very bad condition. Uh, but that was also resisted. And, then, and, and then, the, then came the real moment of the color revolutions, because at that point, they, tried, they actually took, they actually trained opposition students in, they took some of them to, the, to Eastern Europe and they took some of the United States and they trained them in programs to do these kind of like manitos blancos, the, the protests where they paint their hands and it was supposed to be Pacific and all these things. Uh, and that didn't work either, <laughs> fortunately. Um, uh, I think it's important, I want to say something about why these things didn't work. Uh, but now we're in a different moment, you know, the, I think the whole question about color revolution existed in a certain moment which, in which imperialism, U.S. imperialism, was in a moment of, 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 of kind of superpower, when there was much less resistance. Now, when it reaches resistance is when it takes on a more fascist character, and that's where we're living right now. Uh, the first kind of uh, appearances of a fascist activity in, of the opposition in Venezuela, the pro-U.S. opposition, happened in about 2014, where they started to shoot people after they lost an election. They lost the election in front of, they lost the election to Maduro, and there was kind of violent activity, and they shot a number of people, especially around Cuban-run uh, health centers. And now it's come back in, in full force. Maybe you've seen the images of where they actually burned a person. They burned a person because he was black, really, because these marches tend to be white, and they saw a black person, and they said, that person's a Chavez, and we're going to burn him. And they burned him. He died two, two weeks later. 
Um, and so if that's not fascism, I don't know what is fascism. Uh, and uh, you see, you'll probably rep recognize, and I don't need to preach to the converted here, that the, the, media, the media representation of this kind of thing is extremely crude. And that's what they play to, frankly. They look for deaths. They produce deaths uh, on their own, in their own ranks. And then they assume that through the media they spin, they can blame them on, uh, on, the, on the government. Uh, and so they actually kill people in their own ranks through, sometimes through uh, sniper fire, but other techniques. And, that will, and they blame the government for that. So I come from a Caracas that's every day changing, right? Uh, every day there's a new development, every day there's different sp uh, springing up of protest, and it's really a, a co conflictual change, situation of balancing forces. I think, Venezuela will, I think the Venezuelan movement, the Venezuelan revolution and process will actually win this battle. And I think maybe that's the most important message I can give to you all, because it's one thing to, to expose imperialism, but it's another thing to show how you can actually defeat it. When Hugo Chavez faced the opposition in 2007, he said, this is, they're trying to do a color revolution, and it's not going to win. And it's not going to win because we have popular support. And that's the best way to defeat a color revolution, is to have the people on your side. And that turned out to be the case. And I think it's been the long-standing lesson of the, of the Venezuelan movement, that the popular mass is on your side. And there's an important thing about why the popular mass is on people's side. And that's partly because the revolution has very deep historical roots. The revolution is not accidentally called the Bolivarian process. So it has a, 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 immediately a reference of about 200 years, because it refers to the independence struggle that happened 200 years ago. And as, as is perhaps not well known, that independence struggle was also a social struggle. It also proposed th such things as freedom of the slaves. It proposed land reform. And these things were not carried out, but they were part of the, the project of the original uh, revolution. So it's these deep historical roots that are not, entire, that are not going to be defeated easily that the opposition will not be able to beat. Even if they manage to arrive to the presidency, they will face a, a powerful movement of resistance. And it, as many examples show, these processes that have deep historical roots cannot simply be displaced on, from one thing to another. I think another very important thing about the Venezuelan process is as the woman who spoke about Korea said, right now, people, sometimes I see that Northern solidarity is quivering, is becoming ambivalent, ambiguous. And that's a totally crazy idea. Because the, the, the thing has actually an existential dimension. It's about a, a large mass of people who have decided they have a right to exist in the world. <laughs> and they're not easily going to be displaced by a group of, of people who are essentially, it's, a, it's essentially about class struggle. And there's a, a, a racist dimension to the opposition. And people are not going to let a racist minority kick them out of history, kick them out of the mainstream of history, which is what the opposition proposes. Um, and so this, this is really a question not just of a government who happens to be in place or a go small government's errors. That would be a crazy way of seeing it. It's actually about a question of a, of a, a large majority of a people and their decision to exist on the earth. <laughs> um, I think uh, well, about what people should do here, of course, people should be very careful about how they read the media. They should ask questions about how that happened. Now, everyone here is already convinced anti-imperialist, but then you have to do education in your context. So people should point out if a person dies, they should investigate why that person died. They should also always ask the question of what social class is, is trying to carry out a given uh, protest or what social class is behind a given proposal. Social class is particularly difficult to read across cultures. But in Venezuela, the basis of this movement are rich people, and they're part of Caracas. And they have not, and I do not think they will be able to mobilize poor people to their side, in spite of the grave economic problems that exist. Um, I have one minute left, apparently, and I wanted to say something, come back to something I said at the start at the beginning. It's not enough to be anti-imperialist, and it's actually foolish to be anti-imperialist. The essential reason, the essential, Jose Mariategui, who's the, one of the great Latin American Marxists, said, Latin America tina sería socialista o no será. Essentially, Latin America will be socialist or it won't exist. The only hope to be a successful, long-standing imperialist project is a project that raises the socialist question, that returns to questions basically of use value, and the basic use value is human life. The planet is another basic use value, and says that these things are, going to, are more important than what imperialism works on, which is essentially exchange value, which is a series of abstractions. Currently, imperialism has a financial character, which is extremely abstract. So I think that uh, that, that we should 
we, I see that young people around the world are interested in socialism, and it would be a mistake for us to sit back with a minimal program and not try to fuse these two programs, anti-imperialism and socialism. The moment points to that being successful. I want to end with a Venezuelan proverb which says, the, the, the pueblo es un cuero seco, tu lo pises por un lado y se levanta por el otro. And that means the, a people is a, is a dry cattle skin. It's a folky message. And you step on it by one side and it jumps up on the other. You can't step it down because it keeps jumping up on one side. And uh, that's true. And I see that even here in Richmond. The young people are resisting. They invent new ways of resisting. They can't be kept down. And it's great to be in a context like this where people are willing to struggle and they're engaged in, in winning, actually. And I think that's the important thing about the Venezuelan context. The left has often found itself to be in a condition of a victim. It's often found itself reduced to hand wringing. And what the Venezuelan context shows us is you can do more than hand wringing. You can actually win. And you can actually defeat imperialism, as was shown in the case of Playa Huron and in the Cuban cases. So we shouldn't be afraid of our victories, and we should defend our victories. Thank you. All right, that was Chris Maybe. Gilbert, everybody. And next up, we have uh, Nikola uh, Ruzic, and he is the deputy editor-in-chief of Picat, a political weekly in, uh, out of Belgrade. He is the host of New Sputnik Order, a radio talk show on Sputnik Serbia. And he is the author of WikiLeaks, The Secrets of Belgrade Cables, uh, published in 2011, and The Third Bullet, Political Background of the Assassination of Zoran uh, Jijic in 2014. All right, Nicola, here you are. Thank you. So, the cost of Serbia's color revolution, that's, that's my topic. Uh, if you are to believe Strobe Talbot, uh, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, uh, NATO did not bomb Serbia in 99 due to the plight of Kosovo Albanians, but because of its, uh, Serbia's resistance to the broader trends of political and economic reforms. After the Kosovo War ended, what was left of Serbia continued to re resist those, uh, those political and economic re reforms. Uh, Slobodan Milosevic remained in, in power in Serbia, min minus Kosovo. And that meant that the war had... Okay. That, me that meant that the war had to be continued, uh, albeit with a different means. The bombs were replaced by, by Serbia's uh, color revolution, uh, also known in Serbia as Bulldozer Revolution on, on October 5, 2000. Here is an observation that uh, we have to keep in mind, even though it is uh, rather obvious. Uh, color revolutions are not an end by themselves, uh, but a mean for achieve, uh, achieving a desired end. Um, Serbia's color revolution, as any other, was not an end of the process, but, but its beginning. Uh, in Serbia's case, uh, it, it was the beginning of a final phase of a, pr a process of uh, bringing, uh, bringing the country to, to line with the uh, Western interests, uh, a process that had begun with sanctions and uh, which was continued with the, with the NATO bombing. So uh, how was Serbia's color revolution organized and what was, or rather still is, its outcome? Uh, first of all, it should... It should be noted uh, that uh, social conditions for, for Milosevic's uh, removal from power uh, did exist. Uh, in a nutshell, people, uh, after a decade of uh, wars and poverty and isolation, uh, people be be became tired of, of all that and uh, willing to, 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 to believe that uh, Milosevic's uh, removal from, from the office w would solve all of, the, all of them, uh, their, their problems, ranging from, from the economy to, uh, to Kosovo, because uh, uh, Milosevic's op opponent, uh, opponents claimed that Kosovo would return to Serbia once uh, Western-style democracy is established. Of course, none of that, that happened. So uh, Milosevic's final public warning that the West isn't attacking Serbia because of Milosevic, but uh, it is attacking Milosevic because of Serbia, uh, it fell on deaf ears, in including uh, my own at, at the time. Uh, so nobody believed uh, him when he said that Western powers want to, to put the entire Balkans under the, their control, that Kosovo would become in, independent, uh, that the economy would be further devastated through privatization and plundering of, of the state and the public own assets. Uh, beginnings of Serbia's color revolution in 2000 can be traced at least back to 1997, uh, when USA and, and, USA and Great Britain, assisted by George Soros and his Open Society Foundation, uh, started financing the network of local so-called independent electronic media. 
the, their desire, of course, was to, to counter the influence of Milosevic-controlled state, uh, state-owned media. Uh, basically, Milosevic's propaganda was countered by Western propaganda disguised under the, the level of independent journalism. Uh, second part of the, of the operation was uh, bringing together Serbian opposition uh, parties, which were too weak and uh, too, too, too corrupted to, to fight uh, on, their, on their own. Uh, America's formed, uh, financed, and trained the democratic opposition of Serbia, this conglomerate of, of seven, 17 political parties that, that stood against uh, Milosevic. But simultaneously, that, that was the, the, the essential part of, of the, the operation. Uh, the youth movement uproar, resistance, uh, was created as uh, it was one of the essential tools for galvanizing uh, wider public su support for the fight uh, against Milosevic. Uh, the movement uh, came out of nowhere with uh, fresh young faces at, at the front, uh, without on one leader, but uh, with, one, uh, with only one message, he has to go, he is finished. So uh, everything uh, seemed uh, spontaneous, uh, Milosevic media claimed otherwise, that uh, the offer was created but, uh, by Americans, but nobody, nobody believed them. However, shor shortly after the, the revolution, both the uh, Washington Post and New York Times uh, published de detailed accounts of how Americans financed and trained members of uh, of Otpor mo movement, how they were trained in, in, in Budapest, in, in Hungary, by the, 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 the principal speaker was retired U.S. Uh, Colonel Robert Halvey. Uh, part of the pre preparation for, for Serbia's uh, revolution was undermining Milosevic's power stru structure from in inside. Uh, some of the, the officials were, were pr persuaded to, to switch sides with bribes or, uh, or threats. That's what uh, Sky News journalist, journalist uh, Tim Marshall suggests in his book uh, Shadow Play. <clears throat> And indeed, um, when, when the day, uh, several prominent members of the, of the ruling structure turn, did uh, turn to the opposition, including the former chief of Yugoslav Army General Staff, Momčilo Perišić, and uh, in 2002 he was arrested for, for spying uh, for the Americans. He was caught in the act with uh, uh, CIA agent, agent John David Neighbor. So, uh, but more, more importantly, on October the 5th itself, uh, a number of high and mid-level uh, police and army officers uh, just uh, uh, ref refused to, to, to follow orders, and uh, they, by doing that, they basically enabled the demonstrators to size the parliament building, the, the state TV, uh, other key point, points for success of this uh, democratic revolution, which really resembled the coup, coup d'etat. But besides bribes and threats, and this is one, one I think, very important uh, part of the, of the whole operation, uh, Tim Marshall uh, claims that uh, in some cases fear proved, uh, proved to be a pow powerful uh, motivator. Uh, a number of pro prominent government of officials were murdered over the co course of many months. To this day, it is not known wh who was responsible. A Serbian industrialist who had intelli intelligence contacts observed, a lot of people started thinking, well, if the Americans can get the defense minister, they can easily get me. It followed on that the people uh, began to look for a way to off the, the sinking ship. And uh, the, in this regard, this is what Neil Clark wrote in The Guardian in 2003. There is evidence that the underworld groups li linked uh, to U.S. intelligence carried out a series of assassinations of uh, key supporters of Milosevic regime, including Defense Minister Pavle Bulatovic and Žika Petrovic, head of Yugoslav Airlines. And it should be added that uh, representatives of, Mil of Milosevic's uh, government, when those assassinations uh, took place, uh, claimed that the West uh, organized them. So the assassins were never discovered, but uh, what is undisputable is the fact that several of the most prominent criminal groups in, in Serbia really did play an important role in the, the October 5th events. And it is also a fact that the CIA had at least one of their assets, a person named Chedomir Mihailovic, uh, placed in the largest criminal gang uh, in, the, in the country at, at that time. Uh, anyhow, when they came, Milosevic's regime fell like a house of hard, cards. And how much money did the U.S. invest in Serbia's, and under quotation, Serbia's revolution? Uh, Washington Post wrote uh, in late 2000 that the, the figure was uh, $41 million from the U.S. budget alone in 1999 and 2000. Uh, Adam Lebor, in his book on Milosevic, writes about $70 million. 
Uh, during Montgomery, former U.S. ambassador in Belgrade and the man who organized the, the whole thing in, uh, while being in, in Budapest, uh, said that it was more than 100 million, but later he clarified that he actually doesn't know the exact, exact figure, but that the United States considered that Milosevic has got to go and that uh, no expense and no effort should be spared to, to achieve that goal. No matter how much the, the big the, the, the investment was, uh, it cost actually Serbia dearly, as it, uh, Serbia after the revolution stopped resisting those uh, mentioned broader trends of political and economic reforms. So what was the cost of these reforms? According to the, to the official da data, almost all publicly owned en enterprises were sold between 2002 and 2011 for, for a meager uh, 2.6 billion euros. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, in International Consortium of in Investigative uh, Journalists calculated that $51 billion do dollars were taken out of the country using the pri privatization law that was, of course, br uh, brought under the influence and encouragement of IMF and, and, and the World Bank. And the final result, uh, two-thirds of the privatized company went ban bankrupt uh, several years after, after the privatization. And in, in uh, 2012, industrial production in Serbia was at a lower, lower level than it was in 1999, the, the year of, of NATO aggression in Serbia, when nothing worked. And there was a, a political price uh, to, to be paid in form of obligatory EU membership uh, accession process, uh, even though less than half of Serbian population supports Serbia's EU membership, and as much as three quarters of positive uh, formal recognition of Kosovo would become a condition, and it will uh, become the condition. Um, and simultaneously, despite the fact that only around 10% of Serbians support the country's NATO membership, Serbia's cooperation with NATO is steadily becoming deeper uh, with our uh, army being reform according to U.S. interests, as WikiLeaks' U.S. diplomatic cables revealed. So that was all the, uh, what Serbia's color revolution was about. Uh, what do Serbs think of it 17 years later? They voted the entire October 5th uh, political class out of the office with the two ter thirds majority in, in the last parliamentary elections. But in spite of that, uh, Serbia still lingers on, on the course that was set on, on that day. Thank you. And that was uh, Nikola Ruzic, everybody. Next up, we have um, Alexander Prigarin, uh, Dr. Alexander Prigarin, uh, excuse me. He is a doctor of historical sciences and professor at the Department of Archaeology and Ethnography, Ethnology of Ukraine at Odessa National University, a social anthropologist who studies the formation and development of cross-cultural environment in the southern Ukraine in a Eurasian perspective, an expert on inter-ethnic relations of Eastern Europe, cultural and community specificity and identity of ethnic groups. Uh, everybody, please welcome Alexander Prigoyin. Good afternoon, Richmond. Good night, Odessa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I am first time in United States at my debut. I hope that uh, next time. Very grateful to the organizer of this uh, action and uh, take part in the discussions such important issues in pharmac of UNAC. Uh, separative graduated Odessa uh, <coughs> Solidarity Camping uh, for the, uh, their uh, support and uh, willingness to help in uh, difficult, uh, very complex time for us. Thank you. Uh, now, <laughs> now, after some time in the comparative perspective of similar events, uh, no one methodological uh, questions that the events in Ukraine in uh, 2014 uh, uh, are a number uh, or of similar color revolutions. Color revolutions, uh, the, this is technology beginning in uh, world uh, in late uh, 1980s uh, years, twice used uh, in Ukrainian. Uh, 
24 and 2014 uh, years with uh, all the massive and spontaneous, uh, spontaneous protests of the all people of country which uh, combine uh, this the similar revolutions uh, <coughs> the uh, obvious factor of totalitarianism or uh, imperialism foreign and domestic a clear plan, a uh, crown seat of the technique uh, at symbols control uh, of the main court uh, events, paramilitary uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, tactics, uh, anything group. Uh, take this technology from the vision elements in the area, <coughs> area of uh, conspirative uh, theory. Conspiracy uh, of the minority, which uh, sk uh, skillfully uh, consulate uh, of demonstrations or uh, dominance. Thanks. Uh, uh, for example, um, re mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks. Reinforced uh, declarations of uh, passive protest. Uh, permanent declarations of pacifist protest against the b b background of gunmen equipped in military uh, ammunition, or uh, uh, in uh, insistence on um, universality uh, these events of protest uh, in majority all in uh, all country. Uh, uh, in uh, this time. Uh, my uh, domestic inhabitant of Kiev, Lvov, uh, Dnipropetrovsk, not participating in street protest. Now understand the mechanism and form control uh, these revolutions. Uh, the import technology, the manipulations of public uh, op uh, opinion, the creative of comprador elite, a group uh, a cold data in the interesting uh, of foreign power. A, a formal uh, um, <coughs> recognition of this uh, as uh, uh, passos uh, purifications. Much uh, has been done in the study specific technology uh, how to make a natural protest movement in pragmatic. Uh, uh, controlled, uh, controlled actions, uh, controlled actions. Recreated uh, the stage of preparations and tactical groups, uh, the uh, deployment of a massive stage action. For me as an anthropologist, uh, the question sound as follow. Uh, as only semiotically setting this space of protest, or um, a rebellion uh, shall uh, be in the uh, carnival of the absurd. Absurd uh, is the uh, uh, was born uh, uh, new absurd and uh, which uh, uh, born new protest. The experience of observations over two time uh, Ukrainian Maidan uh, uh, convinced me uh, of the number common trends uh, which give uh, the tools uh, external uh, directors. Uh, at the same time, I wonder the uh, relationship uh, center periphery. It uh, is uh, the region covered uh, by uh, any uh, authority as revolutionary. Uh, in this case, the uh, surrounding territories uh, was uh, not given uh, uh, the same rights. When in Kyiv on the Maidan uh, <coughs> and Islamic uh, his traditions picked it uh, up by the individual regional center and no one uh, threw to provide them with similar demonstrations. On uh, behalf, uh, behalf of the uh, old people uh, could speak only a totalitarian uh, center, uh, hidden uh, behind the uh, slogans of uh, democracy, but uh, built its uh, le uh, legality, uh, uh, sorry, legitimacy by mobilizing uh, the whole country. 
when part of this country acted in a similar way, uh, it is uh, an nonsense uh, or um, ochlocratical uh, parody. Uh, the tragic uh, uh, cons uh, consuc uh, sorry the uh, the tragic uh, in, in the main tragic these situations uh, in my native Odessa or Donbas or other territory. Now civil war uh, continue. It uh, seems uh, that it's very far from uh, solar Richmond. But uh, first time the uh, chaos in Ukraine was arranged, including at the experience of taxes, this possible town. And uh, secondly, uh, imagine such a picture. You live in Richmond, uh, honor of George Washington, go to uh, going to walk, raise child. But sometime, uh, somewhere in Facebook, organized the different group, uh, uh, virtual uh, community, fans of uh, uh, Roosevelt or uh, part, uh, party uh, love beer, uh, beer or club uh, red uh, uh, and other. Uh, because nothing terrible. This was uh, not confrontations. Uh, for uh, some strange uh, conclusion, this group appear as protest in Washington and size power with the direct help to foreign uh, capital from other powerful country. For example, the Russian uh, hacker mobilized Ameri uh, American society uh, in this group uh, in uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, for, uh, <coughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, your neighbor suddenly bring in the, <coughs> sorry, uh, you continue to live, but in Washington came laws and another better, uh, one another better. For example, banning other hair colors except red. Yesterday, how many blondes uh, dies in these colors? And your neighbor suddenly brings in the FBI uh, that your son, uh, the, uh, he remember dark hairs. But uh, he, he, he uh, decided beer, drink Pepsi Cola. Uh, and uh, this, uh, sorry, this absurdi uh, absurdity is which we live in uh, is a little difference from the pictures that I have present uh, here. It is not uh, utopia or uh, fantasy. It's uh, our presence, but um, uh, maybe pos uh, possibly uh, your f f future. Post democracy as a model of state in social system are a reality as several st uh, states, which uh, until recipe shared uh, other values. Thank you for your attention. All right, that was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Pigarin. Next up, we have um, Professor uh, Ludmila Pichichiva. Um, she is an associate professor at Russian State University for the Humanities. Um, she volunteers with the Russian World Patriotic Veterans and research related to the Holocaust in the International Science and Education Center. Um, in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies uh, portion of the Russian State University. Um, and today she will be speaking on the current anti-government protests in Russia. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. I'm very glad to um, participate in the UNEC conference and as well as to uh, take part, I'm sorry, to take part in this panel that is devoted to a very crucial problem. Uh, the technologies uh, of color, color of flower revolutions uh, abroad and in Russia as well. Uh, so, um, what about Russia? Uh, because my colleagues um, have delivered their speeches on uh, this problem related to the color revolution uh, in their countries. And what about Russia? The technologies of color revolution are actively used in Russia as well. And I would like to say that, um, that according to uh, 
2007 uh, survey, um, it was observed a total decline of political activity in Russia, um, but it couldn't be predicted a sharp um, rise of political movements and anti-governmental anti protests in 2011. So we can uh, saw that anti-government protests uh, in December 2011 and uh, March 2012 uh, at the Bolotnaya Square uh, with the, the main um, Russian um, oppositioners such as Alexei Navalny, Ilya Yashin, uh, Julia, uh, um, Ch um, I'm sorry, Chirikova, um, and in different uh, regions um, in Russia as well, gathered, gathered thousands of people and uh, became the issue and became the issue under discussion. Uh, but uh, according to uh, 2015 um, official um, and uh, um, inde independent uh, service, um, it was a decline in 20, for, for example, 30% um, of Russians in tw uh, 2015 versus 22% uh, of Russians in 2012 have more negative attitude to uprisings and protests that uh, lead uh, to the collapse of the country at large. Um, you know that um, um, ca uh, the technologies of car revolutions um, are the most um, effective tools of the spread of uh, democratic values and ideas. And um, as I have said before, um, 198 uh, methods of nonviolent uh, action um, were described in the book of uh, Jin Sharp. But anyway, um, I would like to focus uh, on some uh, anti-governmental protests that were held uh, in um, Moscow and in some uh, Russian cities uh, in uh, uh, 2017. So the first, uh, the first uh, anti-protest uh, governments um, took place uh, in, uh, on the 26th of March 2017, and. Um, uh, um, the, the, the protest in Moscow, anti-governmental protests in Moscow, uh, were organized by Alexei Navalny and his followers. One of the interesting features uh, of this uh, protest was the increasing numbers of young people, of youth, especially students. And according to the both official and autonomous uh, sources, uh, these students uh, were promised to be financially supported, to, to give money. Um, so what about the second um, anti-governmental protest? Um, um, I, I would like to say that they were took place on the 2nd uh, of April 2017. And um, you know that social nets and new technologies became one of the perfect means uh, for organizing the event riots and the granted protests. And before, uh, before this day, um, some groups on VK, VK is like uh, Facebook. Uh, VK is a well-known uh, Russian social net. And it's very popular, not among youth, but among adults. And um, before this day, before the 2nd of April 2017, um, some groups uh, with uh, different motives, such as um, we need uh, reforms in the country, we are against misrule, mismanagement and corruption, or for example, let's participate in uh, anti-governmental riots uh, on the Red Square. And all these groups uh, were, um, um, I mean, people uh, who, be who belonged to, to, the, to these uh, groups on VK uh, wanted to force people to uh, participate in these actions, in, in these uh, unauthorized actions. And concerning uh, official and uh, um, independent sources, uh, a very big, uh, just a big uh, amount of followers of these VK groups were bots, unreal um, internet users. It's also very interesting. And the th second mass uh, anti-governmental uh, anti protest um, took place uh, on the 12th uh, of June 27, uh, 2017 in Moscow. And um, first of all, um, the authorities 
and uh, the, pro um, the activists uh, came to an agreement uh, about the location and about the form of this uh, integrated protest. But uh, before this day, uh, Alexei Navalny and some of his followers uh, decided to change uh, the location of um, th this um, protest. And um, so he, I mean, Alexei Navalny, uh, was behind the, behind the bus on the 12th of uh, June 2017, but his followers uh, came to at the center of Moscow, and it was just lots of provocations. Um, um, lots of lots of young people uh, at the age of 15-25 and pensioners took part in uh, these protests. Uh, thanks to uh, oh, thank you so much. Th th thanks to uh, journalists and independent experts, uh, it's also known that uh, some of the uh, pro activists in Russia have very close connections with the, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy and National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. And of course, um, we need uh, changes, but first of all, um, we need constructive changes and uh, reforms. But um, Protestants uh, exaggerate um, social, economic, and political problems, and they do not try to solve these problems. Um, I think that, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for, for your attention. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, I will answer them with pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, and that was Professor uh, Pichichivia. Um, thank you very much. And next up, we have uh, Matthias Benyik of Hungary. Uh, he will be presenting on George Soros's Open Society Foundations and their role in color revolutions. Uh, Mr. Benyik is chairman of the Hungarian chapter of ATTAC, Attack, an international movement for democratic control of financial markets and their institutions. He is an economist and social scientist who is specialized in trade policy issues and economic integration. Um, he's participated in several international and national campaigns against uh, George Soros's various foundations and the World Trade Organization, as well as anti-war, anti-fascist, and anti-poverty issues. So without further ado, here is uh, Matthias Benyuk. Thank you again. Uh, as far as uh, George Soros' role uh, in the color, color revolutions, uh, I also prepared a text which is too long. So again, I have to, uh, you know, to be in the time limit. To, to I'm, uh, I will concentrate on the main issues. So. Uh, George Soros Foundations all around the world is well known. And uh, the people's uh, opinion about Soros is changing, uh, of course, uh, differently because if you are a liberal mainly and, and uh, you are, you are uh, on the side of the capitalist uh, system, then of course they are praising Soros. But it, it is uh, not so clear. However, uh, I would say that uh, uh, Soros uh, was uh, also an important figure uh, to teach or to help uh, to help the present uh, uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban to power, and uh, Viktor Orban was studying at Soros Church Foundation's money. So uh, at the moment, I would say that the main problem with Soros is that the previous socialist system was uh, helped to, to, be bring down, to, to, to bring down uh, by uh, George Soros Foundations. So uh, all the color revolutions we can see the role uh, of Soros as a negative 
and not only in the color revolution, as I mentioned, but also in the Hungarian system change, and all over the world where there is uh, tension and trying to, to, to bring down uh, progressive forces, leftist forces, you can find the hand of Soros. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't have time to go into detail of uh, Soros uh, uh, CV or, 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 or his, uh, uh, you know, starting from Hungary and uh, going, uh, going through uh, London uh, and uh, coming to the United States. Uh, anybody who is interested in, in Soros uh, uh, life, you can find many articles on the internet and I will not uh, go into details on that. So what I would like to emphasize that uh, the revolutionary organizations and the working class uh, movements are, of course, uh, in, in, a, in a deep uh, back, uh, how would I say, in, in reducing the resistance of the, of the working class people because the organizations of the left in the different countries are not promoted. There is no, no mass uh, support. So I don't want to over exaggerate the role of Soros. And my main critique is that in the previous socialist countries, the working class is unable to organize themselves from the bottom up to make a, 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 a real strong movement. So why are we joining UNAC? Because we think this organization is the right one to try to uh, unite on the different issues and to bring back, you know, a humanistic society all over the world. And this mission is welcome and I'm very uh, glad to be part of this UNAC. Thank you. All right, and that was uh, Matthias Bentik, everybody. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Phil Willedo. Um He will be presenting on the US role in Iran's green movement. Uh, Mr. Willedo is the editor of the Virginia Defender newspaper, the coordinator of the Odessa Solidarity Campaign, uh, a board member of the Campaign Against Sanctions and Military event Intervention in Iran. Uh, he wrote in defense of Iran, notes from a US peace delegation's journey through the Islamic Republic, published 2007, and an open letter to the anti-war movement, how should we respond to the events in Iran? Uh, that was published in 2009. And without further ado, here is Phil Willedo. Thanks. Um, I want to talk about Iran's green movement. And uh, I'm going to time myself here. Um, because it, is, it bears all the hallmarks of a, uh, of a color revolution, although it was not successful. And so it's interesting in, in, in that regard. Back in, uh, in 2009, um, there was an election. Uh, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was running for uh, a second term, and he, was, uh, he had several opponents, and the most prominent of which was uh, uh, a man named Mir Hussein uh, Musabi. And Musabi was projected in the West to be a reformer um, and a moderate, while in, uh, President Ahmadinejad, if you remember, was projected as being uh, a literally a crazy man, um, someone who denied the Holocaust, uh, anti-Semitic, 
um, very reckless in dealing with the West, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, the book that I wrote after touring Iran and then spending the next year researching the country and talking to Iranian Americans and, and, uh, and, and so on, um, we were able to expose a lot of these, these lies. Ahmadinejad did not deny the Holocaust. He said, if there was a Holocaust, remember that word, if, um, it happened on European soil, was conducted by European people against European Jewry. Why do the Palestinians have to sacrifice their land as a solution? And I had the opportunity to, uh, to have a conversation with the Iranian ambassador to uh, the United Nations. Um, and we had been uh, hosting meetings. I had pulled together several meetings for uh, President Ahmadinejad of peace and social justice activists in New York. And... Uh, um, and I had an opportunity to speak with him one time, and I said, you know, I know everybody wants you to tell you how to run your affairs. You know, all the peace activists ha have, have suggestions for you, you know, like President Ahmadinejad should wear a little better clothes. You know, he doesn't really look our president. Really, they said stuff like this. Shave his beard. That would help. I said, but if there was one thing I could suggest, if he could just say, don't use the word if. Don't say if the Holocaust. And the ambassador said, why not? I said, because, you know, then it raises the question of maybe he's saying it didn't happen. He said, that's not what if means in Farsi. <laughs> in Farsi, it means, you know, it, it happened, and, 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 and in that case, uh, why did this happen? It doesn't mean a condition. It doesn't raise a question. You know, and that's an example of how the West can, can you know, he never said wipe Israel off the map. That, that phrase does not exist in Farsi. He was quoting Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who uh, said that uh, the, the Zionist entity will disappear from the face of the earth. He meant in an historical sense. And Ahmadinejad explained this to Amy Goodman uh, and Juan Gonzalez in an interview. He says it's going to collapse like the Soviet Union did. He was never saying Iran should attack Israel and kill Jews. As a matter of fact, Iran has the, the, the largest number of, of uh, Jews in any country in the Middle East outside of Israel. That's the truth. Some 30,000, they have synagogues and mosques and so on, and Ahmadinejad donated some money to the Jewish hospital, and during the revolution, the Ayatollah Khomeini sent a personal note to uh, the Jewish hospital and thank them for caring for victims of both sides of the revolution. So, I mean, that was one example of the types of, 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 of lies that were told. But in 2009, there was an election, and Musavi was portrayed as the reformist, and he lost. And the government said Ahmadinejad won by about two-thirds of the vote. And the West said that's absolutely impossible. He was a horrible dictator. He had no support in the country. Um, and interestingly enough, a research company funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, which includes on its board of directors uh, Newt Gingrich and uh, Condoleezza Rice, um, did a, a poll in Iran, and they predicted that Ahmadinejad would win the vote by two-thirds, because he's an economic populist, and two-thirds of the country is poor and working class, and Musavi's support was based in the Western-oriented, middle-class, educated, particularly youth, particularly in the north of Tehran, which is sort of like the Upper West Side and Upper East Side in New York City, as opposed to the South Bronx, or South Tehran, where Ahmadinejad had his support. I can't go into all the details and so on, but, the, the, but Musavi, before the election, declared that it would be stolen. And it, it, when he lost, uh, his supporters went out on the streets in protest, um, in pro-democracy protests that were really played up in the West, and they became violent um, and they were suppressed. And the, the reports that were given here was that the government initiated the violence, and, uh, you know, I looked into it uh, extensively, and, and those were lies. The, the violence started, and this was all from Western sources that we got this from, from Reuters, from BBC, from so on, that it was a, pro a section of the protesters who became violent, a section that was not really representative of the main protests. And I know this because I spoke to friends of mine who were in the protests um, as observers, you know, they weren't really, they were very horrified by the whole thing, actually. 
but they on both you know just the violence of it but they said that there were squads of young people who were obviously operating with discipline and organization who were burning buses and and attacking uh, trying to force the crowd to attack uh, police and so on these are the characteristics of a color movement um, you have to look at the social base as brother Gilbert said from about the Venezuela situation the counter-revolutionary protests in Venezuela, and it says, even the Associated Press will report that. They start in the upper-class neighborhoods. They make a big point of saying that. In, in Tehran, the protests were all in North Tehran, which is the better off, uh, uh, more modernized section of the city as opposed to South Tehran, which I have visited. And it's traditional, uh, religious, uh, traditionally religious, more so than the North, but that doesn't necessarily mean politically conservative. People voted their economic interests. Two weeks after the election, the same two uh, researchers that did the poll for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund had an op-ed in the Washington Post in which they said, I know everybody's saying that uh, Ahmadinejad stole the election, but uh, this was completely consistent with the research that we did before the, rev before the revolution. What was different about the Iranian revolution is that the United States does not have NGOs there. George Soros does not have a presence in Iran. The U.S. Aid for in in Agency for International Development doesn't operate in Iran. There's no embassy in Iran. So there was no way to funnel... I mean, Soros brags about how he bought photocopiers and spread them all through the socialist uh, repu republics when there was a Soviet Union, you know, to, to support dissidents and so on. That situation did not exist. I have, tw well, I have 20 seconds remaining. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, you kept holding up the same, you have one minute left before in the previous speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me to be quiet. I'm just, I'm almost finished. You have to look for the, the class basis of, of, the, of, of the, the, the uh, opposition. You have to look for the political demands. They're always for democracy and against corruption. But Musabi was supported, his main financial supporter was uh, Hussein Rafsanjani, who the Forbes magazine describes as one of the richest men in the world, who owns 300 private universities, and whose political philosophy is privatization, of government resources, uh, cutbacks in social services, and deregulation of industry. I know a woman whose Iranian husband sent him a copy of Alan Greenspan's uh, economic books, and Rafsan Johnny wrote back and said, I've already read those. So he was the financial backer and the political manipulator for Musavi, who was the symbol for the Green Movement. Most of the people on the streets were good people. I know that but they were manipulated by wealthy Iranians with a, with a, uh, a, a, oh, that was it, okay. And that's what we have to look for in the color revolutions. Thank you. All right, that was Phil Willado. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have um, Ray McGovern, who's going to give us sort of an overview. Uh, Mr. McGovern is a former Army Infantry uh, Intelligence Officer and CIA Analyst who served under seven presidents and nine CIA directors. He was one of the senior analysts who prepared and briefed the President's Daily Brief. He also chaired uh, the National Intelligence Estimates. Um, he is a co-founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, and his website is raymcgovern.com. Uh, and he will come on up and talk to us. Uh, first off, uh, truth in advertising. I'm from the South Bronx, and we all voted for Ahmadinejad. <laughs> <laughs> he was the People's and, and the uh, the Republic, uh, the People's Republic of the Bronx, is now voting as I speak to deny Colin Powell and Attorney General Eric Holder, both of them born in the Bronx. Uh, their Bronx citizenship were revoking their passports. Yeah. 
Now, about this Green Revolution, there's only one Green Revolution, Phil, and that's, that's the one 100 years ago in, in, in Dublin, all right? No, no, don't be forgetting about the real green, the real green revolution. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the way we used to do color revolutions, and we used to do it with the Marines. It was a lot cleaner, and it was a lot easier, and, you know, it was easy to explain, too. These uh, color revolutions are kind of a real bung, bummer to explain. Here's, uh, here's the captain of all these uh, uh, earlier uh, revolutions. His name was Major General Smedley Butler. And he was the winner of two, not one, but two uh, medals of honor. This is what he said. Uh, yeah, I joined the Marine Corps at age 17, sort of like uh, Mad Dog Mattis. No, Smedley Butler didn't say that, but that's uh, about like, I think, uh, Mad Dog Mattis was at 19 or so. Okay. And I commanded expeditions to the Philippines, China, Nicaragua, Cuba, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Honduras, and Haiti. Whoa. Winning two medals of honor. Four years later, he said this. I spent 33 years and four months in the active service as a member of our country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. Most of my time was spent as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. I helped make Mexico especially safe for oil interests in 1914. I helped Haiti and Cuba, decent place for National City Bank. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909. I Sugar interests, Dominican Republic, Honduras made that right for American fruit companies in 1903. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room says, uh, a swell racket. I was rewarded with honors. Looking back at it, I feel I might have given Al Capone some lessons. At best, best he could do was operate in three city districts. I operated in the whole world. Now, the Marines are pretty active still in certain areas, especially in Latin America, but they can't do much in, in places like Europe where, where they're close to what used to be the Soviet Union and now is Russia. Now we have a different way of proceeding. We don't use the Marines, and we generally don't speak about using the CIA because they've changed their name into the National Endowment for Democracy. Sounds a lot better than the covert action staff, doesn't it? National Endowment for Democracy, got that? NED. Now, I want to say a word about that because uh, Cole Gershman, the head of NED, is really quite an interesting guy. Um, he, he wrote a, uh, an op-ed in the uh, Washington Post a month before the election last year, so in early October, and he said, you know, liberals in Russia aren't strong enough to stop Putin, but we are. Oh, we are, yeah. With reset. The United States has the power to contain this danger. The issue is whether we'll summon the will and the money to do so. Whoa, that's interesting. If I were Putin, I would read that with interest. Here's Gershman. Uh, he says that the NED um, is ready for uh, fixing things in what we now call regime change. And it traces its antecedents back to 1983, when Reagan and CIA Director Casey thought they'd give a better name to the covert action uh, overthrowers of government staff and decided to call it the uh, NED, uh, which circulates its money through NGOs. And at the time of the putsch, the coup in Ukraine, we identified about 63 NGOs found, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. The other thing he said here was that this is really interesting. He said, um, um, he said besides, uh, besides uh, Ukraine, uh, Russians too face a choice. Um, they may find themselves, Putin especially, on the losing end, not just in the near abroad, read Ukraine, uh, but within Russia itself. In other words, Russia saw Ukraine as sort of a little stepping stone for regime change in Moscow. And as you know, five months later, there was a coup 
in, uh, that was coup in Kiev. So what I'm saying here, and I'm trying to figure out how much time I have left to say it, uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, we have a situation here where uh, the methods have changed, but the objectives appear the same. And when you get colors put on revolutions, well, that's just window dressing, really. What they're trying to do is remove these people. And the only effect it's really having is to make uh, Putin more and more popular. He enjoys about 80% uh, approval rating. And, uh, you know, when uh, Megyn Kelly interviewed him, some of you, I hope, saw that. When Megyn Kelly interviewed uh, Putin, you know, one of the tough questions she asked, what about, what about oppression? What about oppression in, in, in Russia? You know? And of course, uh, <laughs> uh, well, what he said was simply this. We have our laws, and uh, people get permits for, for demonstrations. When they violate those things, they get arrested. But you'll notice something about our police. Uh, they don't have automatic weapons. Uh, they don't have any, weapon, any weapons at all, actually, the, the ones that contain the crowds. And they don't really need them because the citizens don't, by and large, have weapons. You know, we, it's not easy to get a weapon in, in, the Soviet, in, in Russia. So what's he saying? He's saying, uh, look, um, you know, we're very different here. And, um, and you, you know, you pretend to have this sort of moral superiority, but, you know, I look at your TV, <laughs> and, and I think, for example, of, he says, uh, Vasi, what, what happened to uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street? Occupy Wall Street. He says, you got all your security forces around, CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, all, you know, how many are there? He says, and you got a fusion center, and this is Putin. He says, then, a gun, gun is Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Well, that's the way they look at us. That's where we are, folks. And so f you can forgive folks for looking at us a little bit uh, hypo hypocritically. Indeed, you know, in many, in many senses, uh, we succeed marvelously in giving hypocrisy a bad name. Thank you very much.